we'll be ready to call if anybody's coming in. Hello, everybody. I can see that people are starting to join us and we'll get started shortly. Um, thank you for being patient. Hope everybody's doing well tonight. <laughs> and thank you for joining us. Hi, Darwin. We're looking forward to the webinar, too. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Darwin. Okay, should we, I think we'll start, and since the beginning is um, just a little bit of introduction, we also have a live feed from Facebook. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Kathy Leff, and I thank you all for joining us this evening. Bakehouse envisions a world that supports and values artists and recognizes their ability to shape, reflect, and transform our world. For that reason, last year, our curatorial and public programs manager, Laura Navoa, launched a series titled Art and Activism. I'm delighted to kick off the season's first program with Shia Reagans, AKA Vanta Black, and Najed Green, looking at art and function of social justice. I want to thank Miami-Dade County Mayor and Commission, Dade County Cultural Affairs Department, and the Cultural Affairs Council, the State Division of Cultural Affairs, the Knight Foundation, Perez Family Foundation, Via Crearte and the Miami Foundation, the Wiley, Arison Arts, and Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Family Foundation for supporting Bakehouse and making programs such as these possible. I also want to thank Laura, Navoa, and Ricardo Moore for their invaluable contributions to this program and for their efforts day to day and looking forward. Follow us on social media for information on our upcoming programs and our fall exhibition season, which of which Shire's mural will be part of. Um, and in October, art and activism will continue with a focus on mass incarceration in November on race and gun violence in Miami when Shira will be joined by Nicholas Griffin, author of The Year of Dangerous Days, Riots, Refugees, and Cocaine in Miami, 1980. Tonight, we're also pleased to celebrate our partnership with the Community Justice Project, whose Artists in Residence program will have its permanent home at Bakehouse. This partnership will help Bakehouse deepen its connections to the issues and needs of our neighborhood in Miami as a whole. It's also an opportunity for our, the Community Justice Fellows to work with and among Bakehouse's amazing multicultural, multi-generational community of 100 working artists. We couldn't have two more outstanding exemplars with us tonight who have used their respective voices to tell important stories that amplify diverse and often marginalized communities to address and affect racial justice, gun violence, social and economic inequities. Our panelists have notable and distinguished accomplishments and careers, much too long to cite in one webinar. So we invite you, we've posted their bios in the chat box um, where you can view them and where you can view them um, completely. And we also invite you if you'd like to, since Shire's project is such an expansive participatory project, and she's been trying to pay all the multitudes of volunteers who have been assisting in its making. Should you like to make a contribution to the Memorial Mural, there's also a link in the chat box as to how you can do that. And any and all amounts are welcome. Um, also, as you, if you place your questions in the chat box, um, if you're watching via Zoom or comment in Facebook, following our discussion, Laura Navo will join us to moderate the Q&As. So now I'd like to welcome Nadege Green, Director of Community Research and Storytelling at Community Justice Project, and Shire Vanta Black Regans, visual artist, activist, and artisan residence at Community Justice Project. 
Shire, you have a background in studied illustration. Nadej, I think you told me you studied dance at New World School of the Arts. Can each of you please tell us, you know, what set you on your path with a social purpose? Maybe you want to take it first, Shire? Sure. Uh, thank you for having me, Kathy. And it's a pleasure to be joined by Nadej. I love her so much. Uh, my background is in visual art and uh, medical illustration. And uh, I often tell people I was born an artist because I was. Uh, I never saw myself as anything else. And uh, I was lucky to have that path nurtured by educators and supporters and friends and fellow artists. And um, I'm thankful to have attended uh, HBCU, uh, Florida A&M University in Tallahassee, go Rattlers. And at FAMU, I was encouraged to know my history, speak about my history, express it in my work. And uh, I'm, I'm really thankful for that experience because it, it informs the work that I do today. Um, I guess for me, I do have a background in the arts and the performing arts and dance. Um, I don't think New World School of the Arts claims me. I'm a New World dropout. <laughs> I'm a dropout of New World School of the Arts, but I certainly got my dance uh, background from the Haitian community here. I first was trained in Haitian folklore. Um, I'm of Haitian descent, so Haitian folklore. And then I trained classically at Miami Northwestern Senior High School. A little bit of Miami history, New World School of the Arts was born out of Miami Northwestern High School in Liberty City proud my Northwestern bull here. And so I, I more so claim Northwestern and my Haitian folklore roots, if I am to credit anyone for my dance background and certainly the Thomas Armour Youth Ballet, um, where I had a scholarship and trained. So, so that's my arts background. But I think uh, my what set me on my path or journey into social issues is growing up as a first generation child of immigrants here in Miami and both of my parents were migrant farm workers um, from Haiti and, you know, they picked the beans and tomatoes and, you know, all of the stuff in Homestead. And so I, I realized and was exposed very early on to inequities, um, but also within a social justice framework, both of my parents were active activists in the Haitian community here and were part of a, non, um, a Haitian rights group called Veyeu, which means watch them. Um, that was based in Little Haiti and I used to hang out during the meetings and help write protest signs in English and in Creole. So um, I was seeing all of this stuff as a kid, not necessarily recognizing what it was I was experiencing, but it was certainly rooted in justice and, and community and what it means to be in community with folks fighting for justice. And so, I mean, when did you discover that you had the, your ability to communicate and write, you know, journalistically? Because oh, I was, I was always a writer. You were always doing that. Yeah, I was always a writer, not necessarily a journalist, but I wrote poems, I wrote short stories. So there was no question. My dance teachers are like, you're the only one who's excited to write an essay. So it, it certainly was always like, you know, my happy place. I lived in the Miami-Dade County Public Library System. Shout out to the library and my childhood librarian, Miss Shanita. We're still friends till this day. Wow. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> But like, you know, I had this like amazing circle of mostly black women who centered me, who affirmed me and, you know, who taught me that my voice mattered, whether it was through spoken word, whether it was through writing or whether it was through dance, that there were all of these ways I could communicate and that I had all of these languages to communicate through. So whether it was writing or through dance, like I was saying something. That's fantastic. Um, I mean, maybe Shire, I'll ask you this, and you sort of talked about this already, Nadej, so you don't have to repeat it unless there's something else you might want to add, you know, about the type of stories that you tell now um, and the, your particular interest. I mean, obviously you just said with your family upbringing, Nadej, but um, is, was there anything particular to your upbringing, Shire, in Miami that imp impacted your perspective on the work you wanted to do here and the work that you're presently doing? Yes, uh, as, as it pertains to gun violence, uh, my first loss due to gun violence was when I was a teenager. Um, and then subsequently I lost two of my first cousins to gun violence back in St. Louis 
And, you know, I've always been loud about issues. I always had something to say about an issue. And that, those experiences changed me the most. And I felt like what better way to address these issues than in my work? Because uh, as an artist, my first outlet is to express myself visually. So if I have something to say, I'm gonna say it visually. And it wasn't until later on in my life that I learned to express myself you know, verbally. It wasn't always so easy. So, uh, you know, I put my own experiences into my work and I feel like as an artist, you have a duty to do that. You have to put some of yourself into your work. Uh, it would be unfair for me to just tell other people's stories and put them on display without, you know, a personal connection. So I have to tell my story first if I want to be able to tell other people's story. And um, so I'm interested in Adej and, you know, because now that Shire is, I guess, the second fellow with the Community Justice Project, can you talk a little bit about the genesis, you know, tell everybody, maybe some people here, I mean, most people know the work of the Community Justice Project, but maybe you can talk a little bit about the organization, you know, why it established an artist in residence program and, um, you know, your expectations for what that will do for the organization and for the community. Sure. Um, so the artist in residence program started actually before I joined CJP a few months ago. Um, it's a community justice project for those who may not be familiar is a nonprofit of movement lawyers um, that is very much centered in the liberation and the affirmation of, you know, black and brown marginalized communities. Um, and they represent, we represent a lot of nonprofits that do justice related work. We help build power in the community. And there's also like the education component of letting people know what's going on from policy level work to advocacy and grassroots work um, and showing up within the legal sphere doing that work and the policy sphere doing that work, but also on the education front doing that work. And so the idea around uh, the artists in residence program that I have the honor of, you know, kind of, kind of in my home, my little bubble um, as director of community research and storytelling, I got to take that part on is that, you know, artists have always had something to say um, and artists are very much a part of our community. And so it makes sense to have, you know, artists alongside lawyers, alongside researchers, alongside storytellers doing this work. And this certainly is not new. I mean, if you looked at the Black Panther newspaper, right, there were always artists, whether it's from cartooning to actually visualization, like that was very much rooted in, you know, Black liberation. Um, if you look at Afro Cobra, right, like, so, there, so there's this large, this, you know, vernacular of art and justice work that goes way back. Um, it's not just starting and it will continue. But I think specifically embedding an artist within our organization is super special because everything we're talking about, whether it's housing inequities, whether it's affordable housing, uh, whether it's slumlords in Miami-Dade County so that you may have affordable housing, but it's not safe housing, um, whether we're talking about immigrant rights, like all of these things artists experience. I mean, you cannot talk about housing and access to affordable housing in Miami and not talk about artists as well because they are absolutely affected by that. You can't talk about climate change and climate justice whether we're talking about sea level rise, whether we're talking about illegal dumping in marginalized communities, you know, whether we're talking about flooding or not flooding and the implications of living in neighborhoods that don't flood, like all of these things touch artists. Artists are not separate from the community, they are part of the community. And so it makes sense to have like a community voice like Shires within our organization and to continue adding community voice of artists to fold in artists under the building the power movement that is already happening but also to inform us um, in different ways as well. Like, like what does an artist bring to the conversation around climate justice and gentrification? What does an artist bring to the conversation around housing um, and, or substandard housing, right? And, and what are some of the ways you see it and experience it or, or can visualize it 
what can add to a report even right like i i am i am big on like making reports not boring um and making things accessible right and so how do you make a report around climate justice in miami-dade accessible it could be a mural right it does not have to be a written report um it could be a series of visualizations right there are so many different ways you can do that and obviously like we're working with Shire, so Shire will also inform like what that would look like within whatever campaign she embeds. Um, but I think it just speaks to how important artists are and not, not just in an extractive kind of way, like, hey, you make art for this movement, but also as a way to say, you know what, like you have something to say about this, that like you're not just being contracted to put something out there, but that you are very much a part of this and you have something to say and we value what you have to say. Yeah, that's really great. I mean, I come, um, my background in art is really from the Wolfsonian Museum, which is a collection that really understands the persuasive power of art. And, um, you know, it, it always believed that visual, you know, the visual language was much more authentic and less biased than the written word. I mean, I guess there are all kinds of stories that can be told, but I come out of the... <laughs> I'm not, I guess I'm not going to challenge I that way. I, think the the quality of art. I don't know about that, but, <laughs> but, but I certainly think that it's definitely a different way to access information. Now, whether or not that information is necessarily neutral is a whole other story. Well, no, it's definitely not neutral. It's definitely not neutral. I mean, I was meaning that it's more that, you know, artists are really at the front line. Like you said, they're right at the front line and and it, their, their language is not benign or neutral, that they do have something to say and they really, um, you know, can affect change and it, it can be persuasive. And so, I mean, that's what that collection is all about. So I, as opposed to art for art's sake right. or art for, you know, so I come out of a background that really appreciates that and like keeps seeking that, in, you know, seeking where that is in Miami. And that's why we are so excited to have embedded in Bakehouse, the CJP fellowship program, and, and especially Shire um, at this time. So Shire, why don't you tell us about the genesis of Say Their Names, I mean, or at least how the project began and where you see it going and tell our listeners about the, the mural that you're working on now. Uh, th this project began about four years ago. Uh, when there was a child named King Carter who was shot and killed in Liberty City. And uh, in relation to that shooting, the first thing I saw online was a video that his father did right after he found his child. And it struck me because it was just gut-riching, raw emotion. And it was jarring. And so when I started to see the media coverage of King Carter's death, I saw my son. Every time I saw him, I saw my child because they were the same age. Uh, I could very well send my, my child down the street and that could have been him. So I, after, after all these feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, anger, rage, all of these things, I decided to do what I do best and that's to create. So, um, I've always been prone to portraits and figurative work because I think your face really tells your story. And if I can help to do that visually, uh, that's what I choose to do. So I started a series of, I started with King's portrait and I told his story. And in that process of researching, I found so many more stories and uh, it, it became uh a very large body of work unfortunately today there are about 200 portraits in the series and i've exhibited that work i've uh talked about the work i've had circles where i talk to victims and survivors of gun violence and i've become an advocate for the people that i interact with and um say their names is basically the evolution of this body of work because I wanted, I wanted more people to interact with this work in a very public way. And I wanted it to be accessible. And I wanted people to be able to come visit a spot and take a moment and not be in an institution, in a, in a, a box where there's work on the wall and you feel uncomfortable. So uh, I decided to focus on names and text 
And um, I started uh, planning this project back in June. And I think that's when we talked, it was back in June, when we met and uh, you were so supportive of this project. I didn't really have to explain much to you. You were on board from jump and I appreciate that. Uh, also other organizations have been very supportive like History Miami. And uh, once we began to work in the community, the community started to come out and I started to interact with more people affected by gun violence, people sharing their, their stories with me and actually adding names to this, to this memorial, unfortunately, because it's important that we remember and honor these victims because so many people are, are forgotten. Do you, do you want to um, show a couple of the images of any of the portraits or? Oh, I do. I can do that. I can show uh, two of the portraits that I've done recently. Uh, this first one is uh, George Floyd. And I wanted to show this portrait because when I was working on this portrait, uh, as you can see, my kids are always around. And I was we working love on this. We love uh, children and dogs. We love children <laughs> and dogs, so <laughs> feel free. Yeah, they're always around. I love dogs, I'm a dog person. So uh, while I was working on this portrait, it was, it was really difficult because I was having very difficult conversations with my friends. You know, he lost his life, you know, during this pandemic and it was uh, recorded and shared all over. And, you know, me and the people that I talked to, we made a point to not, to not watch this video and to not watch videos like this. And uh, so I was working on this piece. My daughter was around, my son was around. And uh, when I finished, um, my daughter asked me who it was. She asked me if this was my friend. And I was very uh, short with her because I didn't really want to go into it. There are parents that chose to share, you know, what happened to him with their child and I don't fault them for it. I just chose to not do that. And uh, so that conversation ended. But another day she came and she saw him online because like the image popped up and she said mommy this is the guy that you drew a picture of and so i said yes she said what happened to him i said baby he is no longer here and i left it at that and uh that became an ongoing dialogue with other friends that i have that have, are parents and how they dealt with having this type of dialogue the fact that we're forced to have this dialogue with children who shouldn't even be included in this dialogue at such a young age. So uh, I wanted to show uh, this image. And there's one more image that I wanna show. This image here is of a young woman. Her name was Brianna Pascal. And she was also a graduate of Florida A&M University, the visual arts program, same program I graduated from and she lost her life last year in the summer. And uh, she- I don't think it's changing images. Do you see it? No, Can I only see, see George Floyd. Okay, let me stop this and then come back. Tell me if you see a different image. Yes. You see a, an image of a woman. And this, let's see, there's a, a young woman. Yes. So that's Brianna uh, Pascal, and uh, she lost her life. She was targeted in broad daylight in uh, Overtown, and uh, somebody hit her car. She got out, and then they gunned her down. So this, her loss touched me because there were so many parallels in our life, and I always think about you know how how easily. It could have been me or somebody else that I know. And I wanted to tell her story amongst, you know, many other stories because, because of the closeness and the connection that I feel towards her. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what your, I mean, this is a multi-year project that still has a long way to go. Mm -hmm. um, so the mural will be finished the end of October. 
Thank you. Hopefully, hopefully. I, I, I feel like I can be done by the end of October. Um, I, uh, I'm motivated to, to complete it by the, by the end of October. You are accepting uh, volunteers. If somebody is interested, we're going to be sending out um, a MailChimp, I think, this week. Mm -hmm. eliciting people who might want to come out and help paint the names. It's a really wonderful. Right. Now, this is the thing. You know, given, you know, the nature of this project and how important it is to me and the stories that we share in that space, if somebody wants to come and help, you have to really believe in this project. And if you respond via email, if you cold email me, uh, I need you to tell me why Black Lives Matter. If you want to help, tell me why Black Lives Matter via email. That's fair. Um, but what's amazing, aside from the pro well, do you want to talk a little bit about, are you open to talk a little bit about how you see the project going forward? So is the, the mural is completed because you, you've been documenting. I mean, you have the... Um, on, baby. You have the, you know, I mean, you're an amazing writer also. I mean, you're amazing, you know, because you've been writing the stories of every person. And in fact, what's incredible is even just being out there working with you side by side, the people who come by, I mean, more people have learned about Bakehouse just from you on the being there and people approaching you. And I mean, I've learned so much just of how you just break, you just have this amazing ability to get people to open up mm -hmm. and tell their story. Mm -hmm. um, so you have all these stories, you have the wonderful uh, portraits, mm -hmm. and then this project. And um, are you able to share with us, you know, your long-term archival project or that's still a work in progress? Yeah, it, it's a work in progress. And uh, I'll share uh, one of the one of the most recent, well, th there are interactions every day, but I was just talking about this young man today. Somebody asked me about him. So there was, I was out there painting and there was his brother in a car and he stopped suddenly. And I was looking like, what's going on? And so he comes out of the car and then he goes right to a name on the wall. So I came down and uh, he was holding his phone up like he was talking to somebody. And I was like, do you know Roderick? And he was like, yes, I recognize that name anywhere. That's my best friend's brother. And I said, your best friend? And he said, yeah, this is her right here. Her name is Rain. And I was like, hey, Rain, what's up? And, uh, you know, Roderick uh, was 16 when he lost his life in 2016. And he was leaving school and he was gunned down in broad daylight. And uh, after I told Roderick's story, I met his mother and some other family members. And they invited me to a peace walk in Miami Gardens. So I said, Rain, have we met? And she was like, no, you know, we have met. She, on the father set, relative on the father set. So she thanked me. I, I said, thank you. And uh, then the brother said, I'm, I'm going to go around the corner and I'll be back. So he, he took the car around the corner and then he walked back. And then he came back with a friend. So him and his friend really start, started to look at the wall and point out names and just reflect. And um, when they saw a name, they connected it with a time period. So they, they saw the scope, that this is a range of time. And uh, I just watched them interact with this, this work of art and to reflect on these names. And, and we dialogued a little, and I asked them if they didn't mind if I recorded them. Because um, it's important to share these interactions because this, this work of art is for the community. It's for the community to engage with and because these are stories from the community. And um, so it was, it was a very meaningful interaction for me. And uh, long term, I would like to compile all these experiences, all this information, all these images into an archive and uh, really treat that archive like a living memorial. So Nadej, um, in partnering with Bakehouse, um, you know, what do you, I mean, I, I think it's such an incredible opportunity for us, but what do you think that, you know, what can we do 
to our artists at Bakehouse or how can we partner more to help? I mean, I don't, it, it almost feels like it's a, the balance is off and I want to make sure that, you know, we as an organization can lift up our end or provide our end to, to this partnership. Um, I mean, I think it'll be so incredible to have Shire among the artists and we have such an amazing community, but, um, you know, what strategies or what is there that we could do, envision that we could do together um, as far as, you know, amplifying even in our own immediate neighborhood, helping, helping CJP do some of the work that it's doing. I definitely think one of the biggest disconnects here in Miami, because it's such a segregated place, right, is that we don't know each other. Um, so taking the time to actually get to know this place where you're creating, I recognize that so many of the artists who are making work in Miami are not from here. And so what does it mean to actually invest in the community that you're in now, right? Like, you know, we always talk about extraction, like you take from the community, um, but what does it mean to give back to the community in a way that is not necessarily charity, right? But giving back for me means actually caring to know about the place that you are. So if you're situated in or near Wynwood, Overtown, Liberty City, Little Haiti, what does it mean to actually know those neighborhoods? You know, um, I heard someone describe some of these neighborhoods as an art desert, and I laugh so hard because I'm like, what even does that mean, right? That just because you don't have a fancy institution does not mean that art doesn't exist here. So what does it mean to actually spend time and be in community with the community that you're in, in a genuine way, right? Like that you really care to be here. So whether that's mentoring, or volunteering with a local school, whether that's actually having like a series of like Miami history conversations. If you want to understand inequities in Miami Dade, you need to understand the history of redlining and the remarketing of Miami as a tourism mecca, even though it is the South South. You know, the city of Miami Police Department were active Klan members and the Klan rode through Overtown in the 1930s. So, like, there's so much of Miami history that gets reimagined in modern times. And so, even orienting your yourself around the history of Miami. Um, you know, in, one of the things that might spark you is climate issues. You know, something that might spark something in you is issues around education. But I think part of good art is actually research. Um, much of what Shire does, right, is actually spending time. She's not just randomly plucking someone, you know, out of nowhere. Like she actually, you know, I, I interviewed Shire before, um, before I made the switch to CJP, I was a journalist and I remember we were talking about, you know, how rooted she was in the families, um, the, the loved ones, the surviving loved ones of the individual she would draw a portrait of, right? And that she would meet the mothers, the grandmother, the, and so much of that, right? Will inform how you work, how you see someone. You know, when we talk about uh, gun violence in Miami Day, disproportionately, it is young black men between the ages of 16 and 25 years old. And when they die, regardless of how they die, uh, typically what you'll see is a mugshot, right? Um, and much of Shire's work is challenging that, like, that your mugshot should not be the final image of you. Right. Um, and what does that say? And so I think, you know, Shire is a perfect example of what it means to orient yourself in the community and what it means to collaborate with a community, create art, um, collaborate. Right. Like, what does it mean to work together um, and what and, and to care what people have to say about this community um, and, and your presence in the community and being open to the critiques that will come with your presence in the community as well. Um, we all know that the while the arts are amazing and can be a catalyst of change, the arts certainly have helped um, and fuel gentrification in Miami as well. And so what does it mean to have those tense conversations around, you know, what does it mean? What is the role of an artist? What is the role of art institutions? Um, and, and what, if any, is there a responsibility to the community that you're in or the community that you move into? And, and, and even if you think you're doing good, understanding that maybe you won't always be well received at first, right? Because again, back to the point of history, History, people know history, right? And they understand what has happened in the past. And so obviously, rightfully, when we look at the transition of Wynwood, for example, and even parts of Little Haiti now, people are gonna say, well, it's great to have art here. Um, 
but was art not always here? When you look at the murals of Serge Toussaint, who was a Haitian artist, right? Um, who drew all the paintings in Little Haiti, but it was not considered, you know, world renowned art, you know, where artists are coming from around the world to paint a mural, but it was accessible art. And, you know, so many Haitian muralists were put out of work when buildings started modernizing and you could no longer do the sort of art that says, this is what's in this store. Um, so, so I'm just saying like, what does it mean to honor these things, even as things change, because we're not saying things will not change, but what does it mean to honor what was there before? What does it mean to honor, you know, the community artists whose names we may never know? Um, and what does it mean to, to make it inviting for people to come in and partake of this work, right? And I think all of those are queries that are worthy of revisiting over and over and over again, whether you're an art institution, whether you're a social service agency, like these are all questions we should ask and these are all things that we should grapple with. Um, what does your presence mean here, right? Um, and, and for whom? So, yeah, those are, I mean, the most important questions. I'm just wondering if, you know, um, if you feel like that is something that can be learned or is it something that people are either innately understand to be curious about a place, curious about people, interested in connectivity, or do you think it's something that one can be prompted? I think all of the above. I think you can be prompted. I think that there are, you know, folks who are comfortable with not knowing because if you don't know, right, then then you can say, well, I didn't know. But like now when you know, you you know that? something, right? Exactly. So I, I, I definitely think that's part of it. And I see um, Darwin's question on how do we get the public to plug in and learn more about our local history. I think, A, we need to do a better job of teaching our local history um, first. Uh, that needs to happen. Um, and, you know, how do we elevate more voices and perspectives that are routinely and systemically silenced? Um, meet people where they are, right? Like, where are the people? Like, you know, Shire is working on gun violence work, right? People like when we talk about gun violence, you know, in South Florida, I think the most vocal voices um, that rose to the national forefront were the young people in Parkland, right? Because of the tragedy in Parkland. And it was an absolute tragedy. And those babies had every single right to scream, to yell, and to say what they had to say. And what I would offer is that the babies in Liberty City, in Overtown, in Little Haiti, who are constantly faced with gun violence weekend after weekend after weekend, who it has touched multiple generations, they also have a lot to say. So what does it mean to amplify those voices too? What does it mean to care to wanna to know what they have to say? Because what I say about Parkland is that people wanted to hear what those young people had to say. And so my question is, do we want to hear what the communities here yeah. have to say? It's not enough to say, and I think Shire and I have both gotten this before, like, oh, you guys give voice to the voiceless. And I always push back against that because I see Serena Saul is in the chat. Serena's not voiceless. Yeah, we're gonna- right? um, Tangela Sears is not voiceless. So this not idea of taking agency away from people, I'm like, in so much as people are, voiceless. It's not that they don't have voices, it's that they're unheard. So what does it mean to actually put that on folks who are not listening, right? What does it mean to listen? Because it's not that the communities we're talking about are voiceless or invisible. We know where to find them. We know the addresses, we know the cross streets. So what does it mean to actually engage with the communities where we know they are, instead of looking for excuses that say, well, these invisible communities. I'm like, unless we're in some like alternate Afro-futuristic universe that I'm not aware of, these communities are not invisible, right? They're very much visible. Though Lord knows we, if we could be invisible sometimes, we may choose that option. Um, but that's not the reality, right? Like we can see the communities um, that we're in. So I think it's caring to actually engage with the communities that we're in, um, making ourselves being, comfort being comfortable with being uncomfortable right? And, and, and opening up spaces for folks to, to participate, right? To be a part of and not just, you know, to be put on. Yeah. Well, that's all really good. And I think, um, I mean, I think that we're really, you know, Bakehouse has been in the community for 35 years and it's, um, I mean, the community has changed over the 35 years, but it's also, you know, a little bit shocking of how little you know, it really knows of the community. I mean, what's so fascinating for me to watch Shire and the way she works is, you know, again, just how many people just, you know, I think because we're walled in. 
So ultimately we want to break down those walls because I think that there has to be, I mean, you found a way, but you're out there on the street. But I think, you know, maybe we all have to just go out on the street initially and, you know, meet people where they are. But um, I mean, it's been so much, um, I mean, even though the memorial is so moving and so um, tragic at the same time, it's also, there's so much um, optimism and just seeing the way, you know, just in looking at the relationships that you're developing or that you've developed and that you've brought into the institution. So I am so grateful, you know, as one of many people at Grit Bakehouse who, for you doing this, you know, on our building or with our building and with, and with the community and for the community. Um, I'm gonna ask Laura if she'd like to just um, come on and see if she's been screening any of the, the questions. Um, maybe you can tell, well, Laura's looking through the questions. I mean, Nadej, can you tell a little bit about how your artists and fellowships are, your um, residents are chosen, when the next round is, what you seek and, you know, how do you identify, how do you determine and screen an artist who genuinely has an interest in this connection and listening to and engaging with the community? Um, so I, Shai might be able to better answer what the well, process is like. We went through that. the process. I um, was not there for the harder. process part of it. Um, but I know certainly CJP is just looking for artists who are plugged into the community and who care about the community and who want to be involved more in community related issues. Um, it's like pretty open um, and there isn't a particular type of art like it can be visual arts it can be performing arts um and you had a uh, musician had a, vocalist. Had a musician a vocalist um for the first um desiree jaha who is amazing um and you know this round we have shire and who knows who's amazing the next who is equally amazing and i don't know who the next round will be right but um they better be dope <laughs> they'll be dope they better be dope <laughs> Don't apply if you're not with it, you know. <laughs> and I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off in the day. No, go ahead. You can talk about the process since you yes. went through the process. <laughs> yes. so, so, Shire, what was it that made you apply for that? And what do you, you know? What do you think distinguished you from other applicants? Because I know there were many. That residency was uh, made for me. When I when I read the announcement, I was like, I'm doing this. And uh, I had already made a point to prepare for it, but so many people sent it to me. So many people sent it to me. I was like, okay, this is confirmation that this is made for me. And the, the actual application process was very easy. Um, when, I, when I came in to have a dialogue with, uh, you know, everyone participating and giving their thoughts, I felt, I mean, it was a room full of people, but uh, I felt really supported. I felt supported, I felt seen, I felt heard, I felt appreciated. And this is not something that you would typically expect from a law firm. You know, you wouldn't expect people to be a, to, for people who practice law and in understanding that type of thinking, very analytical, very by the book, you wouldn't expect them to understand the importance of art. Well, I didn't, you know, because it's not very often that I interact with lawyers. It's usually when, you know, I'm helping somebody uh, you know, deal with their case, you know, like a, 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 victim, a victim of gun violence, you know, their family has to interact with lawyers. So I didn't expect this. I didn't expect the reception. I didn't expect the support. And I, I was completely floored. I talked to my friends about it for weeks. I know they were sick of hearing about how amazing this interview was. And, and it wasn't even like an interview. It was a discussion about how we can support one another. It wasn't like, you know, typical residencies where you have to prove your worthiness. You have to tell us why we, we should give you this opportunity. Uh, coming into that room, it was, how can we support one another? What can we do together? How can we collaborate? How can we help you? And uh, it, it was just amazing. And then seeing uh, Black women in the room, which is typically not something that, that you see. And the, the support and encouragement that I had in that room from, from those sisters, I'll remember it forever. And uh, if, if you're down for the cause, 
If you're ready to do the work, then you should apply to the residency. Well, we're so honored to have you. Laura, do we have any questions? Yes. Um, hi, Nadesh. Hi, Shire. Thank you so much for these um, very important um, conversations that you're having with us and with the community. We really appreciate it. Um, we actually had someone call in and leave a voicemail <laughs> with a question today. <laughs> so, <Okay>. great. <laughs> um, I it. so it, it's for it's for Shire, but um, Nadesh, I feel like you can also answer this question. So I'll, I'll you know. I'll prompt it to both of you. Um, as a Black female visual artist, advocate, and mother, what would you like the younger, younger community to take away from your work? What are your hopes for them? Ooh, uh, I, I would hope that uh, the younger generations will see this as a starting point and then take off. I, I feel like uh, the youth are so energized and motivated and informed now. Uh, I think that, you know, seeing, seeing us do it or me do it is only going to fuel them in the future. And I would like to see them to continue what they're doing now because this type of, this type of uh, mobilizing of our youth is, I haven't seen anything like it. And I hope that they continue to do it. Right on time. Speaking of the youth. <laughs> do you have something that you'd like to contribute? <laughs> what, um, what, and then Nadej, do you have any opinion about the, this next generation or young people in Miami? And You know, I, I think the one thing I would say is like not to shrink um, and not to be afraid to be authentically you. I think a lot of time moving in spaces, especially as a Black woman, as a Black queer woman, as first generation child of immigrants, like you are, you are taught in so many different ways that like you are not enough or that you have to present as something else, or you have to be a version of something else to be complete. And just to know that you are complete as is, that you are complete and that you bring so much um and, you know people are always like oh when are you going to get out of your neighborhood that whatever neighborhood you're from like it is an asset you know it's not necessary and people are like oh can't wait for you to get out and i'm like i don't know i went to school in liberty city and it is the best like i went to miami northwestern high school and it's a whole mini hbcu so like the teachings and learnings and everything that i got at my school was amazing but on paper and if you let other people describe it like oh those inner city kids you know it's like a title one school it has a high poverty rate and so people like to like you know define you by the negatives or or by things that they perceive as negative but just because someone perceives it as negative does not mean that it is so do we have a, another question, Laura? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Shara Nadesh. Um, Shara, actually, someone's asking how the progression of this mural um, has changed you. Who asked that? <laughs> Is that an anonymous? <laughs> it's not. It's a really um, good question. <laughs> Serena, I think, um, and I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Serena? Or whoever asked that question, thank you. And uh, so th this mural changes me every single day, every day. Uh, I, I make a point that when I go out there, I clear my mind, I ground myself, and there are quotes that run through my head, uh, quotes that, that guide me, right? And throughout the day, the interactions you're, you're never prepared for them. You just have to engage and accept. Uh, I think one of the reasons that, you know, artists aren't really willing to, to leave the comfort of those walls is because you are open to physical and in-person critique if you have to engage with people who are viewing your work. And not a lot of artists want to do that, even though we're trained in critique. But, you know, when you have to answer someone who is not in the art world, who doesn't know all that jargon, when you have to answer for something that you created, 
People are, are terrified by that, but I'm not because this is for us. So the interactions that I have continue to inform the work. And, uh, you know, I've had conversations about, you know, you know, people feeling like I shouldn't criticize the police. And, you know, I welcome that dialogue because that's what I'm here for. And then I have conversations with people who feel like their, their loved one, nobody cared about them, you know? So I, I welcome that type of dialogue. I have people that don't say anything, they honk. I have people that just bring me offerings, which I love. Which is amazing. And, <laughs> and it's, it's nourishment for me. It is guidance for me as an artist and you always have to be willing to be guided. So it, it's changed me immensely. And if you don't change as an artist, um, can you really call yourself an artist? Great question. Thank you so much, Shire. Um, we actually have a couple questions that uh, have to do with your next steps, your evolution. So I'm just gonna kind of ask both of them um, and you can answer. Um, Say Their Names was an evolution of your work as an activist. What do you think the next evolution will be? Wink, wink, online platforms. That's from Darwin. <laughs> and I love then, Darwin. <laughs> Thank you, Darwin. Darwin so, has a lot of questions. <laughs> Darwin, is, listen, Darwin is in, inquisitive. He is a historian. So is Darwin, Darwin the one who's been helping you paint from the History Museum or no? No, that's Malcolm. But Darwin has been out there to help me paint. He has been out there. And, you know, a couple years ago, Darwin and I sat down and I said, Darwin, how do I put all this information into a place? Help me do it because I don't know. And, uh, you know, we talked about how I could do that. And, um, and he and I have been brainstorming about this living memorial, this, this archive of all of these conversations, this information, these experiences, uh, because this type of work shouldn't sit on a website in, in a very mundane way. It needs to, it needs to live you know, and because these are actual human beings, these are not faces and stories that I made up. So I want to treat this work with care and I want it to be in a place where people can just engage with this work, even if they can't physically come to see the work or see the memorial, they can read about all of these people who have been impacted by violence and the people that love them. There's actually a mother here in the chat. Her name is Serena. And Serena is a, uh, a mother of a victim of gun violence. She lost her son in 2016. And I feel like uh, our relationship, I know she's tired of me talking about her, but our relationship, it, it developed out of just, it, we were meant to meet. And, uh, you know, I learned so much about Isaiah and so much about her. She is an artist. She's a spoken word artist and she speaks about her experience because she has been re repeatedly silenced and criticized. So our, our bond is so important to me and I, I value her. I'm not gonna cry. I really value her. Thank you for being here, Serena. Thank you, Serena. I'm glad she's you, Serena. <laughs> um, Shire, after this project, where do you see yourself going next? So uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll just leave that up in the air. Um, well, you'll definitely be at Bakehouse for a while. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll leave that up in the air, you know. Um, it's fluid. It's fluid. Um, so for both of you from... Loni, I hope I said that correctly. What would you say to your younger selves? Did you ever envision your work impacting the world so powerfully? That's from the days, right? <laughs> Yo. for, the, for the both of you, for the both of you. Okay, I mean, go ahead. Give me a minute. I don't know about the whole impacting the world powerfully <laughs> part, um, but... I don't know, my younger self thought I'd be a ballerina. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<laughs> uh, so so feel, but I would definitely tell my younger self, trust your talents. Um, I, I certainly had a lot of like doubt and imposter syndrome moving through the world as a writer. So I would definitely tell my younger self that like, this is who you are and trust that. Um, so, yeah. I would tell my younger self that um, trust your instincts. Um, I, I, I say that because, you know, it, being a black woman and a, and, a, and a visual artist, it's, it's something that is not encouraged, it's frowned upon, it's frowned upon growing up in, in certain spaces, right? And I, I, I had educators that, that guided me. And uh, sometimes I, I, I really doubted myself when I should not have. And uh, doubt will have you in a very dark place. But I'm so glad that that doubt is gone. And um, it's one of those things you have to, you have to work through and I'm so glad that I had support to work through it because not everybody is able to work through it. You know, many people who, uh, who I knew in visual arts programs growing up are, are doing nothing in that realm today, which, which is their choice, but it's, it's because of a doubt placed on them and people discouraging them and you go in this box, you don't go in this box. So, uh, I'm I'm really really glad to have progressed to this point. <clears throat> so, I have another question. I think this might be a good um, question to end with, um, both for Shire and Nadej. Um, as an artist activist, what do you need from organizations and from the community? <laughs> or what would you ask that? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I thought she was going to ask Morel's question. I'm like, yeah, that's a fun one. I'm like, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> I only see from Morel a wow. Well, I just saw Morel, so we can okay. end with that. Morel. <laughs> no, we can do both. Let's do both. Okay, okay. Let me, let me try to hit both. Okay, the first one, say, say that again. Say the first one again. Um, so the first one is, as an artist activist, what do you need from organizations and the community? <laughs> I need organizations to, to be about it. If, if you are in a community, you need to interact with that community. And if you are in a community, the people that are part of your organization need to reflect that community. Um, it's, it's easy to put a cheesy black square on Instagram and think that you have solved, <laughs> you saw racism. Uh, black Lives Matter, black square. You got to do more. Um, and what's up, baby? Okay, one second, okay? Um, you need to put your money where your mouth is. It's all right. It's okay. You didn't disturb me. Um, as far as uh, Morel's question, um, <laughs> thank you, Mina. She you, is, let me tell don't, I'm so glad she can't hear because, oh, this, this is a start. Mina? Um, you me? Somebody, uh, Morel's question was, oh, and money wasn't an issue. What would be a dream project? I don't know. I, I, I don't know what that looks like artistically. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Right, give, give me a minute, go ahead, Nadege. Well, while you're thinking and, and you could opt just to let him wonder what you would answer. I would like to shout out to Mina Jagannath, who um, is one of the attorneys and, and, and co-founder co co of the Criminal Justice Project. Unity Justice Project. I mean, Mina, thank you so much for, you know, Mina has, I mean, I think I met Mina probably, I'm trying to think, it was almost two years ago, shortly after I started at Bakehouse, and it was Mina who proposed with um, Aja Monet, this partnership between the Community Justice Project and, and Bakehouse Art Complex. So I'm, Mina, I am so grateful to you 
for knowing this would be such a, a wonderful opportunity for our organization. And especially at a time when um, we really, you know, do want to, you know, be of service and in, in, the, in the way that you express Nadej, you know, with be in communion with the community. So um, this is the perfect, I mean, this is the perfect collaboration. And um, Shire, you're like the, the perfect mediator to help us, even just watching you and listening to you listen to people. It's such an incredible gift um, and pleasure just seeing, you know, just how respectful you are of all the people that you encounter every day. So that's why I've been like trying to sneak little bits of time just to learn from you because it's a, it's an extraordinary talent and I don't think it's something that you can learn, but it's something that I really notice that, you know, I lack. <laughs> but anyway, is there any other, um, anything else? I think anything we have to ask some more questions so he's not mad at us because Morel asked a question. <laughs> Let's get, let's, let's finish answering um, the, the questions that Shire responded to. Is that okay, Nadesh? Do you want to go ahead? <laughs> Shire, are you going to answer your dream? Pro oh, I'm doing that? Okay. Um, I echo what Shire said about the organizations. I don't have to say anything else on that. And as far as dream project, I would, so I love like community archiving and like, what does it mean to archive work? you know, outside of institutions and such, um, which I do some of already, but I would like probably, like if money was not a barrier, I started a Black Miami Day project on Instagram um, that shows like the history of Black Miami Day, but I would probably like blow that up and make it as big as possible um, with money being no object and like teaching community archiving and like so much of like Black Miami's history is in your grandmother's closet. It's in, you know, it's, it's with the elders and when they pass so much of that goes with them and it's not um, held on to. So I definitely want to capture uh, those stories. I would love to capture those stories wholesale and, you know, teach what it means to archive your community um, so that other folks can do that as well. That's really important great well, that's it? oh that's dope i would can i be your assistant i love that i think we should all i mean i think you should enlist us all i mean it's a really important project i mean there's so much um you know there's so much in miami that people don't know and there you know there is a generation that's passing i mean even in you know the neighborhood of bakehouse i mean there's 15 percent of the neighborhood are the elders aging in place who still know a little bit about the, you know, the neighborhood they've been there. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it, I mean, the idea that if we could ever, if you could ever fulfill your dream, I mean, I think we should all rally around it and try to see how we can make that possible. It's something that needs to be done. Bit. All right. <laughs> so we enlist everybody who wants to support the dream. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, I want to thank you all so much. I mean, I want to thank all the listeners and our audience for joining us tonight. I want to thank Mina again for bringing this partnership, um, Nadej for now being the bridge, and we hope that you'll be spending time in Bakehouse because we have so much that we could learn from you, and I'm sure that you will really enjoy the wonderful community that we have there. And Shire, what a pleasure, and to see your you know, what you proposed just a couple of months ago. I mean, it's a really vast, extensive, time consuming. And because you take so much time to hear each story and to it's so carefully and lovingly and sensitively executed at every level. And I really appreciate the, um, the thoughtfulness of every aspect. And Laura, thank you so much again for your idea to do this series on art and activism and we hope that you all will join us again for the next program in October to be announced on our social media. Thank you all so much and have a good night.